Hello and good evening and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. What a lovely thing to look at across a completely full house. Well done you. Um, my name is Jenny Niven, um, I am Head of Literature at Creative Scotland, um, but I also had the singular ple pleasure this year of being acting director here at the Book Festival over the winter months while Nick Barley was off on his um, sabbatical to judge the Man Booker International Prize. And one of um, the fantastic projects that I was able um, to be involved with was The Magnificent Outriders. Um, so please join me in giving a very warm welcome to two of our Outriders this evening, Malachi Talek and Jennifer Hay. So um, what we have in store for you is for me just to introduce both of our guests and a little bit about the project. Um, and then I'm going to leave the stage and um, let Malachi and Jennifer take it away. They have um, some photographs to show you. They are, it's a little bright at the moment, but hopefully as the sun just dips a wee bit, um, the images will become a little bit clearer for you. Um, they're going to do a bit of a double hander. Um, we, I think there's something quite special in that. No, I'll let them, de let you des let them describe that for you as it comes up. But they're going to um, discuss for about 25 minutes, half an hour, I'll come back on and ask them a couple of questions and then we'll open it out to the floor so you will have a chance um, to do some quizzing of your own. Providing there isn't an alien invasion or too many <laughs> other loud emergencies. Anyway, so on my left, um, in the middle here, is Malachi Talek. He's a novelist, a journalist, and a singer-songwriter. He received a New Writers Award um, from Scottish Book Trust in 2015, um, and was one of the recipients of the Robert Louis Stevenson Fellowship the following, no, the same year, 2015. His book, 60 Degrees North and the Undiscovered Islands, which some of you I'm sure are very familiar with, um, are published by Scottish Publishers Berlin. He's contributing editor of the online magazine, The Island Review, and was previously editor of Shetland Life magazine. His first novel, excitingly, has just appeared in proof, I believe, in the last day or two, but it'll be um, for sale um, next May, um, coming out with Canada. So even just from that little short kind of snippet, you can see what an exciting um, couple of years Malachi's had in his writing career. Uh, John Burnside says of Malachi, and this is really just to embarrass him because I know you'll hate having to sit through this while I say it, he, but John Burnside says, Malachi Talek is the real deal, a writer given over to pure curiosity, honest witness, and the most precious of gifts, an unselfconscious sense of wonder, which is a rather lovely thing to say. Joining Malachi is Jennifer. She is Jennifer Hay. She is the author of five novels. She's been awarded the Penn Hemingway Award for Debut Fiction, the Massachusetts Book Award, and the Penn New England Award for Fiction. Her most recent book, um, her fifth novel, Heat and Light, was named a Best Book of 2016 by the New York Times, no less, um, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and NPR. Uh, she's originally from Western Pennsylvania, where much of her fiction is set, but she currently lives in Boston. Um, Richard Price said something rather nice about Heat and Light, which is that it is a greyhound of a novel, smart, sharp, hyper precise, and near incantatory in its momentum. Wonderful. There's quite a few things in there that I think you will agree made them a very interesting um, choice for our Outriders project. Um, Outriders was basically, when I came into uh, the book festival in November, late November, we were all reeling from the recent election in the US. We had a very loose idea about um, a big extravagant project involving sending writers on journeys across the Americas. Um, but we probably, when we'd been thinking about that as an initial idea, we hadn't predicted Trump. Um, and that really actually provided such an amazing kind of canvas for this project to really um, kind of be brought into full colour. The questions that that um, arose for all of us, um, the way that kind of I think a lot of us were quite shocked by, by um, those events and the questions that that provoked in all of us. What does that mean for the US? Why have we, why have we ended up in this position? Um, and how are the other countries kind of around the US going to be able to relate to that and what will happen next and are they kind of being driven by the same forces that has led to that appointment so what we did in the end up was to um, choose writers five Scottish writers um, selected for a range of reasons but one of them um, was that we wanted to work with people 
with whom we couldn't predict exactly what they might do with the commission. So in Maliki's case, um, he is a fiction writer, he's a journalist, he's a singer-songwriter. There's a lot of different possible creative avenues that he might have picked up on um, to, to, go, to use as his tools when he began to kind of um, describe the journey at the end of things. And then we took each of the writers. We had some really fascinating discussions with them about where they might want to go, which, which would be the influences that would um, shape their travels. And then we matched them up with people um, who were based um, in the areas that they were really interested in traveling. And not that those people would be guides, but that they might go on the journeys with them and through the kind of amazing alchemy <laughs> that is creativity, you could have these two creative people who would be looking at the same stimulus but then come up with completely different responses. So that was one of the kind of primary things that we hoped would happen. And I'm excited um, this evening to hear if that, in fact, has been the case. Um, I think that is just about enough for me. And I'm dying to hear what you guys have come up with. With. Um, so please give them another lovely round of applause while I leave the stage. So we thought what we would do this evening, since our journey involved an awful lot of sitting down next to each other in a car, talking, discussing the things that we were seeing, we thought we might kind of recreate that to some extent and, and sit down here and discuss some of the things that we saw with you. Um, and to do that, we decided to use some photographs as prompts. I had not counted on it being sunny, so you might not be able to see it very clearly. <laughs> it is improving, but we'll see how it goes. We're also going to both read a short piece to you that we've written about the same place, and we have not actually read each other's or heard each other's pieces yet, so it will be a surprise to us and to you. But it's worth beginning by talking about the journey that we took, which hopefully you can see on the screen. You could see a moment ago. Can you remember? Um, so we began in North Dakota in Bismarck, and we did a kind of loop through parts of North Dakota and then into South Dakota. And at that point, Jennifer abandoned me for a while, and I continued on through the Great Plains, through Nebraska, Kansas, and then into Missouri, Kentucky, and the Appalachian Mountains. And Jennifer rejoined me for the last part of the trip from Tennessee down through the south into Mississippi and ending up in um, Louisiana. Um, this is not good. Oh. Well... <laughs> Okay, you know, some ideas work, some don't. <laughs> what I wanted to speak about was what could have gone wrong. What you can't see in front of you is the vehicle that we <laughs> traveled in on this journey, which was, we thought, an enormous vehicle and then discovered that it was the smallest vehicle in North Dakota. <laughs> and I think that both of us came into this project excited about what might happen, but also a little bit nervous? Yeah, um, so I was invited to join the project in March, I believe. I got an email from the book festival. I was tremendously excited about doing this and said yes immediately. And then I thought, oh my God, what have I done? I'm going to get into a car with a total stranger for three weeks. What could go wrong? Um, and, you know, it's... It is a challenging situation for writers because we are introverts, all of us. We spend most of our lives alone in a room and we're very happy that way. And so to step out of my solitude for a period of weeks and... ...tolerant people. Mm. And so there was a fair danger that we might not have got on. In fact, we like almost no one. <laughs> but fortunately, Jennifer is reasonably tolerable. And so... I'm blushing. <laughs> so it turned out it, it went okay? It was okay. It was okay. It was okay. I think we're going to read something now. I'm going to start off by, we're both going to read a piece from 
North Dakota, one of the places that we both really wanted to visit was Standing Rock, which at the time of the election in last November had been kind of going on in the background, was also part of, of what we were hearing. And that the kind of contrast between what was happening there and what was happening in, in politics was, was interesting. So we went to visit the site. In a half bare field in south central North Dakota, birdsong stipples the air. The ground is weed strewn and baked dry, and the pair of us, Jennifer and I, are picking heads down through the dust. Like sandpipers, we stop and peer and stoop at what we find, rubbish abandoned weeks before, shards of plastic, broken glass, toothpaste tubes and shampoo bottles, tampon applicators, cutlery, a lid from a pot of organic soup, chicken, quinoa, and kale. The rubbish belonged to protesters, or water protectors, as they preferred to be called. They came here to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline from crossing the Missouri River, just north of the Standing Rock Reservation, of which this land is a part. Thousands of them from across the country camped here for months, until, in late February, the last of them were moved on by police. For the Native Americans amongst them, not just the Lakota Sioux, whose land this is, but representatives from dozens of other tribes, the pipeline is a cultural and environmental threat. The development, they argue, would destroy sacred sites along its route, and any future oil spill would be catastrophic for the people, animals, and plants that share the Missouri's water. For the others who joined them here, the protest was about solidarity. It was about civil rights. It was a battle against the vague, faceless forces of industrialism, of capitalism, of white supremacy. Many of these visitors were among the last to leave, ignoring calls from the government, law enforcement, and ultimately the tribe themselves to go home. While these protests were still ongoing, a Lakota artist called Charles Rencontre built a 10-foot tall sculpture of metal and concrete on a bluff here above the sacred stone camp where the Cannonball River meets the Missouri. It is still on that bluff today, a broad, seated figure, earth red, with arms crossed on its raised knees. It stares over the floodplain, impassive. The sculpture is based on a bowl pipe design from the 19th century called Not Afraid to Look the White Man in the Face. That design emerged in an era of bloody conflict between the Sioux and the government, culminating in the massacre at Wounded Knee in December 1890. The pipe was a political statement, at once beautiful and defiant, and this sculpture shares that defiance as well as that beauty. What it says, though, too, is that what happened here at Standing Rock was not merely an isolated protest. It was not something new. Instead, this gathering was part of an ongoing dispute, a fight against persecution that has raged for a very long time. The sculpture spoke of continuity. Since that red figure was completed, offerings have been made here, gifts of a kind, and they lie in a pile beneath its lap. There is a length of rope coiled like a serpent and a scattering of shells, rocks, and coral. There is a circle of sticks tied together and a plait of straw. There are beads and necklaces, candles, and a drumstick. There are plastic bottles of water. Above the camp, the floodplain and the field, two vultures become four, then half a dozen. They hang in the hot air, wings splayed, seeming hardly to move at all, and yet turning, turning in broad circles as though binding each other with invisible threads. We watch them, Jennifer and I, gaping upwards, then turn back to the car.
On Sunday morning, we drove to the site of the Standing Rock protests. The protesters had been gone for months. We wandered without speaking, examining the trash they had left behind. I was grateful for the silence. The scene moved me in a complicated way I didn't understand and couldn't possibly have articulated at the time. Some potent mix of desolation, grief, and shame. It's a feeling I would carry throughout our time in the Sioux Nation, at the casino, at Standing Rock, and especially on the reservation. I wondered later if Maliki felt what I felt. Oddly, though we talked about everything else, we haven't talked about that. But if I had to guess, I would say that he did not. I am an American. I was raised and educated like an American. Though I never crossed paths with an Indian, as they were called at the time, they played a minor role in the history I was taught at school. Our origin story, the founding of our great nation. Christopher Columbus discovered America. European explorers conquered its wilderness. White settlers civilized it. Little was said about the people who'd lived on that land for thousands of years, who hadn't discovered it, but had simply always known it was there. How their land became our land was a question no one bothered to answer. It didn't fit with the narrative, our unshakable belief in the greatness of the American experiment, a project so noble that it doesn't merely justify whatever means brought it into being, but exalts them. The history curriculum in a typical American public school is a love letter disguised as history. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson referred to always as the founding fathers, are venerated as secular saints, their vision and wisdom and unimpeachable character presented as historical fact. These mythologies reach far beyond the classroom. For most of our short history, the conquest and control of native people has been a primary subject of American literature, music, and film. The Western is our Beowulf, our Viking saga. Bonanza, The Big Valley, Gunsmoke, my parents grew up on those TV shows. As a child, I saw them in reruns, but by then the culture had shifted. The baby boom generation, raised on a steady diet of heroic cowboys, had begun to subvert those conventions. And by the 1970s, the Native American had become a powerful symbol of our government's rapacity and ruthlessness. The theft of land from indigenous people was, for the first time in white culture, acknowledged. Two centuries after the fact, Native people were recognized as survivors of genocide, their descendants relegated to the poorest land, meager in natural resources, barely arable. It is telling that my most powerful childhood memory of Native Americans came not from Westerns, but from this TV commercial. <laughs> As a public service announcement, it's pretty effective. As a child, I found this so deeply upsetting. I had never seen an adult cry for any reason. And in this case, the reason was my fault, the fault of any kid who'd ever spit a wad of gum onto a sidewalk, as I had certainly done. Picking through the trash at Standing Rock with Maliki, I had a similar feeling. I was ashamed of my Americanness. It's a feeling that visits me not infrequently in recent months, and I'm not alone in this. 
It is, I believe, the new American zeitgeist, our national condition in the age of Trump. So we each chose photographs, and Jennifer doesn't know what I chose, so it's going to be a surprise to her too, but um, do you want to speak about this one that you chose? Yes. Um, so this photo, which you can almost see, um, was taken on um, the Cheyenne River Reservation in the Sioux Nation. Uh, we stayed there one night. Um, it was the, the same day we had gone to Standing Rock. We, we drove there. and. Um, the reservation was, to me, a very haunting place. It was strikingly quiet. Um, there were very few cars on the road. It was a Sunday afternoon. And um, there weren't very many businesses open. Um, so we took a walk around the reservation. And um, I was struck immediately by the number of um, public health bulletins that were plastered everywhere. So this, in case you can't read it, it's a, it's, a, it's a panel of three um, paintings. There's a pregnant woman, a fetus in utero, and a, a child, a male child. Um, a mother's choices forever prevent fetal alcohol syndrome disorder. Um, my brother is an accountant for the federal government in Washington, D.C., and um, one of the accounts he manages is the Indian Health Services. And as we were walking around Standing Rock, I found myself wondering how much of their budget goes to stuff like this. You know, that's their anti-smoking announcements and wear your seatbelt announcements and um, domestic violence is a crime announcements. And this one that I, that I found most haunting. Um, one thing you're struck by walking around on the reservation is um, how unhealthy people Look, and these are diseases of poverty. Um, even at the uh, Standing Rock Casino, the um, Prairie Nights, um, where we uh, spent an evening, it was striking how many of the patrons there who were themselves Native Americans were um, in wheelchairs or um, toting IV poles on oxygen, you know, relatively young people who were in a terrible state of health. And, um, you know, watching this, you just had the feeling that this, this is a people that has been nearly, nearly decimated um, by this kind of confluence of, of government policy and kind of other social factors. It's a, it's a really complex question. We don't have a lot of time to go through these photographs, so we're going to, I'm going to skip a little and um, move on to this one. <laughs> we need to talk about Wendell. <laughs> so this is Wendell Berry on the right. Um, Wendell Berry is one of, if not my favorite writer. He is a novelist, a poet, and an essayist. And when I was planning this journey, when we were planning this journey together, one of the things I really wanted to do was to go and visit Wendell Berry, whose work I have admired for a very long time. And so I wrote him a letter. He doesn't use computers. Um, and several weeks later, got a letter back saying, yeah, you can come and visit me on this day. You can come. He farms in Kentucky. So. This was, for me, one of the, the highlights of the trip. We, we got to meet um, several writers. I got to meet several writers along the way. But this, this really was one of the highlights for me. And it was something that we spoke about quite a bit because we have a, a shared love of his work, which is about the land, about our relationship with the land, about community in particular. Shall I move on? Yes. This is Whitesville in Appalachia, in West Virginia. And what you can sort of see in this photograph is a hint of the kind of place that I saw in, 
in parts of, of Appalachia that was perhaps, along with the reservation, one of the most shocking things along the trip. The kind of rural poverty that exists in, essentially in coal country, places where the, the coal industry has been the main, main employer for a long time and now does not employ many people. And in fact, this was very shocking to me, but this is the kind of place where Jennifer grew up. This looks like home to me. This could be in my town in Pennsylvania. I grew up in a coal mining town, uh, it was a company town. And um, when I was a, a kid, it was a really vibrant place. Um, then when I was uh, maybe around 13, 14, the mines fell on hard times. And by the time I finished school, coal mining was all over in Western Pennsylvania. And what had been um, a bustling economy um, just, just kind of ground to a halt. Families moved away in droves. Um, and uh, the people who stayed had a, a very difficult time making a living. My whole generation pretty much has left the town I grew up in. Um, it's, and you know, this, these stories about, about the Rust Belt, about coal country, uh, we've been hearing a lot of them since the election. Um, we've heard again and again that it's a lot of these rural um, working class voters who have elected Donald Trump, and I'm sad to say that that is true. Uh, I was back in my hometown in Pennsylvania last week, and um, the Trump signs are still up. Um, except for my, my immediate family, my mother and my brother, everybody I know there voted for Donald Trump. And uh, by and large, they seem uh, quite satisfied with the choice they've made. And it's, a, it's a, an another reason I carry this kind of shame that I was talking about. Uh, I do know these people. I, I do know the people who elected Trump. And seeing places like this certainly gave me a, a very new and very different perspective on, I suppose, on the people who made that choice last November and the kind of desperation in some cases that that choice has come from. So this, this was a photo can we took. Can you see this? No. You can't see a thing, can you? <laughs> ah, all right, well, I'll describe what it is. So. Um, Malachi and I took a swamp tour in southern Louisiana. Um, and so this is um, a photograph taken from the boat we were on. Our guide, Jimmy, is um, feeding an alligator um, with raw chicken thighs at the end of a fishing pole. Um, this is taking place in the Mandalay uh, Wildlife Refuge. There are signs prominently displayed, do not feed the animals. Uh, but Jimmy has been doing this for 30 years and um, in, in absolute defiance of, of the signage. Um, and you know, it was, it was sort of a fascinating drama to witness because he's very charming, charismatic Cajun guy, great storyteller. Um, and he makes a great show of calling the gators, calling the gators. Interestingly, the gators were not coming. So for the first 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, he's calling the gators with like this mounting desperation that you can hear in his voice. Um, because that's, that's how he makes his money. That's why people take these swamp tours. He has to deliver the gators. And so um, when finally one appeared, there was this sort of palpable relaxing and, um, and uh, he could sort of just amuse us with his storytelling. So what you cannot see in this photograph <laughs> is a tall pillar in New Orleans, which until just before we got to New Orleans had a statue of General Robert E. Lee standing on top of it. And this was something that we saw in various ways and read about while we were traveling through the South, the ways in which the Confederacy and the Civil War, that those memories, how those memories are now changing and how the way it is remem remembered publicly is changing. And that includes removing some of these monuments that have stood for a very long time. And it includes to trying to remove, for instance, Confederate flags in, in public places. Mm -hmm. um 
at the time uh, we arrived in Louisiana, I think this statue had been down three or four days, maybe. And the way it was taken down is very telling. Um, it was by order of the mayor of New Orleans, Mitch Landrieu, um, and they were city employees who took the statue down, but they did it after midnight, and they wore hoods. And the, you know, the parallels to what is happening in the US right now, of course, are, are chilling. Um, it's this whole question of removing the Confederate statues is a really emotional one for a lot of the people we talk to. Um, we uh, had a visit with a, a, a writer um, in Louisiana who is in her 70s, um, a, a white woman who grew up in Mississippi. And um, it was very interesting to hear her take on the removal of the statues. Her feeling fundamentally was, Um, we talked to a lot of different people who had um, varying views on it. Um, but, you know, I never imagined then that we would be here three months later and this question of removing the Confederate statues would have erupted in the way that he has this weekend in Charlottesville. It's odd for me to be in Scotland right now. I feel that my country is on fire. And it's, it's not an accidental fire. I feel like it's, it's an act of arson. And I think we have not yet seen the worst of the reaction to this removal of the statues. There's a, there's a lot of anger, and um, I'm nervous about going back. There is a, a demonstration, a free speech demonstration, in Boston, where I live, this Saturday. And um, free speech demonstration has become a kind of coded language for um, white supremacists. And uh, I, I, I don't know what Saturday has in store for the city of Boston. This certainly for me was one of the most complicated issues um, through the whole of, of this journey. And it was something that we talked about a lot. And in particular, the notion of nostalgia for the Confederacy, the way that many white people in the South still hold this, this odd sense of, of nostalgia for what was lost in the Civil War. And I think for a lot of Northerners, they see that as primarily about race and about slavery. And Southerners see it differently. They see it as about place. And it's it's such a complicated and irreconcilable disagreement that, I mean, we, we talked about it at great length and I think neither of us know how to feel about it still. That feels like a really appropriate moment to sort of pause because um, I think it really exemplifies that old kind of adage about traveling that the more you understand, the sort of less you know in a way. Um, I'm curious to, just in terms of the fact that both of you have lots of different um, kind of creative practices up your sleeve, when you encounter something like the rawness of these issues that you're discovering. Did you find that your urge then is to report them in a more journalistic manner, um, to be able to convey that immediately, or do you feel that that's something that can come through fiction just as easily? I went into this project expecting to write, not journalism exactly, but reflective essays based on what I had seen. And I made notes along the way anticipating that as the outcome. And when I came back home and wrote up my notes, I found that I couldn't do with them what I thought I was going to do. I, I couldn't get at the issues that way. And so I wrote up my notes and, and a few bits of it I felt I could shape into something usable. But things like this, things like the, the South, I just could not approach it. Mm in that way. I, 
I couldn't work out how to deal with it. And I think that it is something that I am going to have to think about and work with in, in a different way, through fiction, perhaps. Yeah. Fiction writers have a curious relationship with the truth. Um, you know, it's, it's an ingredient in what we do. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not the end result exactly. What you're trying to do when you write fiction is to get at a larger truth, the truth with a capital T, that is not factually accurate so much as um, conveying a deeper truth about an event. Um, I went into this with just the opposite impulse from Malachy's. I am a novelist and short story writer. I went with the intention of writing fiction and I ended up writing essay, something I never do. And, um, you know, it's, I, I may yet write some fiction um, inspired by our journey. There are at least a couple of stories I, I want to tell. Um, but I find um, the essay form is very appealing to me right now because I'm, I'm trying to get at get at some questions that are not characters' questions, they're my own personal questions. So I found this, this experience to be much more personal than I thought it would be, and my writing about it is much more personal than I expected it to be. Um, one of the lovely things about this commission and something that I've never really been able to do as a programmer before was to say, we are going to take a leap of faith and be comfortable without giving a really set outcome to the writer. Um, and that's a luxury that only something of the scale of the Edinburgh International Book Festival allows you to do. Um, and it was one of the big risks, I think, of the project to be able to say, OK, we're going to be OK with not knowing necessarily what you would come back with. But I think that's given us this real, it's really exciting, actually, to, you know, to have you come back from your travels and to see, I don't know if anybody in the audience came on Sunday night to the showcase that showed a bit of the work from each of our five pairs of travellers. Um, but between that and the five conversations that people are having um, on stage in the kind of yesterday and today reveals this extraordinary wealth of things that people are producing. There's poems, there's a novella in the works, there's a, a kind of gathering of Robert Louis Stevenson's um, stories from Argentina that have never been presented before. There's theatre work. It's, it's been really, really rich. Do you have a sense I of what you think will come next for both of you on the longer kind of term? I, I think if you had asked me to do this and you had said, I want this many words written by this point in time, I would have had a much harder time saying yes. I probably yes. still would have said yes, let's be honest. But <laughs> it would have been a much more daunting project and it would not have been freeing creatively in the way mm. that this turned out to be. As I said, I went thinking that I would come back and write essays, and that now is not what I think I will do. I went not knowing what the next book I might write would be, and I now think I have the next two books <laughs> that I am thinking about. <laughs> and these are ideas that are kind of directly and indirectly inspired by places or ideas that came out of this trip and came out of discussions that we had along the way. Jennifer? Um, well, as I said, I came with the expectation of writing short stories, and I may yet write a couple of short stories based on this experience, but, but the essay form is really what has been calling to me. Um, so I have um, sort of a longer narrative project that I have started and, and am in the midst of now. And I've also found that a novel I had started <laughs> Um, has an unexpected connection to this journey. And mm. so there's, a, there's sort of a, a fourth act to this novel um, that I, I didn't know until I took this trip. So more on that to come. Oh, great. Is there any scenario where you might produce something collaborative? Just there was an amazing synergy between those two first mm. pieces and the imagery, and I would, I would rather like to see that. Yeah, we've talked about it. It could happen. No way. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm never driving with her again. <laughs> Well, let's open up to the floor because there's probably some questions um, from our audience too. In fact, there's a hand up right away. I'm sure there will be a mic in circulation. There it is. Yeah, let's start with the lady in the back. Sorry, I hate mics. Um, it, it's more a political question, I think, than a literary one, so perhaps it doesn't belong here. <laughs> no, it certainly does. Okay. It very much does. Um, I think you, you've both spoken incredibly movingly about uh, what you've witnessed. Um, and I take uh, the importance of that sense of place very strongly from what you've each said. 
And I'm just wondering what you think and feel at the moment about a brighter future that respects that sense of place but uh, doesn't lead us into that reactionary, ghastly scenario that we have at the moment. You know, if you had asked that question a week ago, I would have had um, a better shot at coming up with a hopeful answer. I'm not feeling all that hopeful at the moment. It's very hard to watch the news from America with anything resembling hope right now. Um, so uh, maybe you can speak to that. I'm not a naturally optimistic <laughs> person. I hadn't um, noticed. <laughs> and politically, I am, I suppose, less optimistic than I, than I have ever been. We all recognize the unpleasant direction things are taking at the moment. And I think that we all have a sense of how that is being exacerbated. That, do we, this kind of polarization of views, people no longer talking to each other, mm -hmm. people no longer listening to each other. But how do we escape from that? You know, I think as, as writers, we sometimes feel that we can play some small part in that, that literature can play some small part in that. But it, it, it is a small part. The changes that need to happen I don't know where those changes are going to come from. Yeah, there was one here on the left, and then another lady at the back. Hi. Oh. Uh, Hi, Dana. <laughs> um, so when you were on the su subject of listening, when you guys were down in um, Appalachia and in the south and the real rural poverty that you were describing, how did you get people to trust you and talk to you? How did you engage people specifically? Um, I mean, there's a lot, I, you, you, there's this, um, as journalists not from the area, you would be you know, part of the fake news world or something. So how did you get the, the people that you met to engage with you? I don't know that we really did. Um, we had some success in talking to people. Um, I think in a general way, though, that if you approach a conversation um, in an overtly political way, you much maximize the chances of, of having somebody shut, shut off completely. Um, you know, on this journey, we um, stayed at hotels that served breakfast in the morning, and every place we stopped, the Fox News was on a continuous loop. And I imagine most of you know what Fox News is, as much as I did anyway. I had never absorbed so much of it in my life as I did on this road trip. Every day, every day, every day. And even if you're not paying attention to it, that soaks into your way of thinking. And, and um, I don't know, that, that's part of why I, I came away from the trip with sort of a, a bleak prognosis for the future, that if, if you are living in an environment where that is ambient, and you are just you are just consuming it without intending to. It's just in the air around you. I know this. I've gone far afield from your question, but I did want to talk about Fox News. Can I just add to that, Jennifer? The, the, I was in the states. My husband's from Cleveland, Ohio, and I was in the U.S. two weeks ago. And in their house, CNN is on constantly. Mm -hmm. And actually, I got a similarly depressing feel from the other end of the political spectrum, which is far closer to my own politics. But just the myopia of it—it it was mm -hmm. just poli American domestic politics. 24-7, and even that as a perspective, just to only be focusing on that one particular story when there was so much else going on uh, more widely around the world, it, that has a similarly destabilizing effect, I think. Yeah, and that is absolutely normal in the US. Yeah. Um, we do a terrible, terrible job of covering international news. And it's become this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that there is the, the belief that Americans don't care what's happening in the rest of the world, so they're never shown what's happening in the rest of the world, and it, and it perpetuates itself in a certain way. So I couldn't agree with you more, and I cannot say that that is a recent development. That has been true as long as I've been alive. Right. I, I think there has been a lot written over the last couple of years also about the way that social media is affecting this, that right. so many people are gathering their news and their information from social media, and the way that 
Facebook and other social media is designed is that it gives you information that it thinks you care about and thinks essentially that you support and, and agree with and therefore people are only hearing those voices. And to go back to your question, I would say that that was the thing that I think we succeeded least at, was speaking to those, to those people. We, we did hear people saying things that we fundamentally agreed with. We spoke to people with very different views from ours, but we didn't speak to enough of them. Thank you. Um, I'm really interested in this idea of the pairing of a kind of two cultural perspectives. And I wonder if you ever had a point where you were driving in the car where you had very different reactions to similar situations given your different cultural backgrounds? That's interesting. Um, just to try and break the silence, I'll just start talking and see what comes out. Uh -huh. That's what um, I wanted. <laughs> the pattern that I kind of felt happening was that we would, we would drive in the morning and we would stop somewhere. We would go and see something, speak to somebody. And we would get back in the car and we would drive in silence for some time while we were thinking about what we, were, what we had seen, what we had heard. And then gradually, we would discuss what, what we had been thinking about. And there actually was never a point, I think, where we had come to fundamentally different conclusions, where we had felt completely differently about anything. I, our thinking evolved through our discussions. A, a huge part mm -hmm. of this trip for me and the impact that it had were these conversations that we had driving through the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's true for me also. Um, initially, um, I, I suppose I had the impulse to make excuses for things that we were seeing and hearing, and I realized fairly quickly that that wasn't necessary. Um, part of it was that I was feeling I was seeing my own country for the first time in some way. I had never been to North Dakota or South Dakota. I had never been to most of the places we saw together. So it, it wasn't a case of uh, me being a tour guide and, and showing Malachi my country. You know, it was as new to me as it was to him um, for much of the trip. And so I didn't have this feeling of um, uh, responsibility for some of the things we were seeing. For example, um, there was uh, a pub we went into in Williston, North Dakota, which is a part of the trip that was entirely my fault. I dragged Maliki there. Um, I, last year, I uh, published a novel that deals with uh, the fracking controversy in Pennsylvania. And I was interested in seeing uh, northern North Dakota where they are fracking for oil in the Bakken Shale. It is a really weird and really unpleasant place that I dragged Maliki to, but I was really glad we went. Um, and uh, the first night we were there, we went into this pub, and um, the first thing you notice, you can't miss it, is that the, the door handles of the pub are made of rifle butts. Through all of North Dakota, there is this kind of fetishization of firearms that I think of as peculiarly American. I've never seen so much taxidermy in my life. And I'm from northern Appalachia, and that was even a lot for me. Um, so, you know, I don't know if, if it was, it was the fact that this was so clearly not my home territory that I didn't feel that I needed to be an apologist for this, for the, the American love affair with guns. Um, I didn't feel defensive about a lot of what we were seeing. Good. <laughs> I, I mean, we're turning this really critical eye on on the States, but I wonder, Malachi, for you, if the course of the journey revealed anything. I'd know that, for instance, Harry Giles um, traveled across Canada, and one of the things that they were really interested in exploring was the connection. Harry is originally from Orkney, and they were looking at place names, um, at, and, and in some ways about 
at Scottish complicity in the genocide and um, the appropriation of lands and things within Canada. Was there anything, given how much time you've spent thinking in your own writing about Shetland, about its position in relation, the 60 degrees north, um, in relation to other parts of the world, did it reveal anything about your own country for you, do you feel? I think there are comparisons that you can draw and we certainly are seeing the same polarization of views in this country as, as you see in the US. Um, Brexit is the obvious example where you have two halves of the country who cannot understand how the other half is thinking. Um, another thing that I have been thinking about over the last few days, I, I've been, since I got back, reading an awful lot about, about the US and reading about the South in particular because because it was such a mysterious place to me. I felt, I went there and I thought, I do not understand what is going on here. I just don't get this. And so I, I, I have read more about the Civil War. And there is a slightly uncomfortable parallel, and I wouldn't want to take it too far, but it is sometimes said that the conflict between the South and the North in the US is something that was partly taken over from this country. The South was populated much more by um, Celts, Scots and Irish, and the North by the English. And something about that conflict, about where power resides in the country, reminded me of issues that are going on in Scotland, issues about power between this country and England. And I would not want to take that parallel too far. There are some very different things happening there. But it, it's an idea that is swirling round, and I probably shouldn't have shared it. But <laughs> hope that it might be something that you would continue to explore. And there's so many questions, isn't there? I feel that it's, it's really provoked quite a lot, <laughs> a lot, I think, for both of you. We've probably got time for one more from the audience. This chap, can we give the mic to this chap over here? I actually, right, we'll take the lady here and then this chap over here, because I did give him a shout about two questions thank ago. You. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I, thank you so much for your very gracious and honest um, thoughts. I... I share your, your interest in Wendell Berry and his philosophy and his poems and his perspective on life. You got so far and then you stopped. I'm wondering if you would be able to share a little bit more about that conversation you had with him. As I said, Wendell Berry is somebody whose writing is hugely important to me, has been hugely important to me for, for quite a lot of years. I came to him because I was thinking about community, and I think that there is no other, no other writer that I know who writes so beautifully, so brilliantly about community, how small communities function, their relationship, the relationship between individuals within communities, the relationships between individuals and place. I also love his writing, his his sentences. I mean, Jennifer and I uh, share a great interest in good sentences. <laughs> and I think Wendell Berry produces the most wonderful, rhythmic, beautiful sentences. Um, so I'll share a detail with you. Um, when Malik and I were driving for uh, the gazillion hours we were driving, um, we never listened to the radio, but we did read to each other. And um, one of the things we read um, was uh, Malachi read to me a couple of Wendell Berry essays. And I was struck by his beautiful rhythmic language in a form that does not always lend itself to that. So I, I um, want to share your appreciation of that. Can I just tell you, um, that Malachi is somebody who, as you can tell, is quite kind of careful with his um, emotional displays, but I have never heard him so excited <laughs> as when <laughs> we first talked about the trip. And he said, do you think the journey might go anywhere near Wendell Berry? <laughs> 
and we helped to kind of pursue that as an approach. And then while Malachy was off travelling in Australia, this was when he'd received um, the letter back from Wendell, which would reveal whether or not he could go and visit him. And he was in Australia, so his flatmate took a picture of the sealed envelope <laughs> and sort of taunted you with it, didn't he? He sent it over to you in the US, and you sent it to us, and we all wanted to know if you could go and see Wendell. <laughs> I will very briefly say that it was a wonderful visit. I, I visited him for three or four hours, and um, he drove me around the area in his in his pickup. And if you want to know more about it, can speak about it afterwards. <laughs> so to, to finish the chap in the green there. Yes, I just wanted to respond to Malachi's statement about perhaps uh, peeping in the south, feeling a bit. Uh, treated second-class citizens as some Scots felt they were relative to the English. I think you can get a very good picture of that if you go on the website for the United Daughters of the Confederacy or the Sons of Confederate Veterans mm -hmm. and you'll see how these people remember the fact that they descend from people who were adversely affected by the American War of the Rebellion is what they refer to it as because after the war ended, many northerners came down to the south and took over a lot of the businesses and the land in the south. So many southerners felt that they were being taken over by the so-called carpetbaggers from the north. And it's this feeling that they have that Robert E. Lee and other southern generals and politicians, Jefferson Davis and so forth, they were fighting to preserve a way of life that included slavery, but included a lot more than that. And I think that's, that's what you're up against here, it is this memory of the way life was at that particular time. And I think the, the websites that I've mentioned will give you a good picture of what that was about. And it, it is also about, it certainly was, and still to some extent is about remembering the dead too. The, the South lost that war and they lost it very badly. It was something like one in four, one in five men of fighting age in the South died during the Civil War. I mean, that's an, inc an incredible statistic. And so for some people, these monuments that are coming down are memorials to the dead. And that really complicates the issue. Jennifer, have you a final thought you'd like to add? No. All right. Well, there's m much, much more to say. Um, both Jennifer and Malachi have books in the signing tent, so do come, um, explore the work a little further, and perhaps ask a question or two in person. But can I just say thank you so much for your engagement and your enthusiasm and your kind of intellectual bravery in the way that you've approached this task. And I, for one, can't wait to see what unfolds from it um, in all kinds of ways, I say, over um, the next year or two. Thank you so much, Jennifer Hay. <laughs> Malachi Talek. Uh, so I've just been at the Outriders event with Malachi Talek and Jennifer Haig and I found it a really fascinating discussion of how not just America's becoming quite polarised and quite uh, a scary place at the moment but also how that kind of polarisation of views is happening in the UK. Um, it was fascinating to see how these um, how these issues have worked across continents uh, have been shared together. Uh, well, I've read some of Malachy's work before, actually, in um, a few literary journals across Scotland. So I was quite familiar with him as a writer. Um, I didn't know Jennifer so much, but I'm a big fan of short stories. I know that she'd published a few in the United States. Um, but it was, I was really drawn to the idea of connecting cross cultures and America is, uh, it's, it's a very upsetting and distressing place at the moment, um, but it is a, it's a very relevant place and there's a lot of very relevant discussions for the future of the world happening with America right now. Um, I think it's important that we pay attention to them and keep hope that the future can be better than what it is currently. So I've been coming to the book festival since I was, about 11, 12 years old, and the first time I came up would have been uh, school tours taking us in to introduce the children's offers. And it's, it's very much become embedded in part of my lifestyle. I'm from the borders, and we have a local book festival that's on every year that's one of the cultural highlights of the year. And I think 
there's there's nothing on the scale of the Edinburgh Book Festival. Um, it's the it's the one truly international book festival in the United Kingdom, I would say, and it's one that gets the most kind of. Uh, wide range of writers it uh, possibly can and it's also so supportive of the Scottish publishing houses which is great to see um, for such a large and um, established and brilliant festival. I think it's a vital thing for Scottish cultural outlook across the UK uh, to send writers from our country and send them out across the world and show them um, how different cultures and different peoples interact and think. And one of the things that Malachi and Jennifer kept coming back to was that they couldn't always understand how people in the deep south of America thought, but it was interesting to engage with these individuals because they didn't understand the way that their mannerisms and their brains had been drilled into the centuries. Um, it's very important that we do that and we're always looking outside of the Scottish bubble because otherwise there's the risk that Scotland, Scottish culture is seen as just being for the Scots and I absolutely don't think that should ever be the case. We should always be an international looking country and uh, I think that's embodied well in the Edinburgh Festival. Just went to the Outriders event um, about the USA with Maliki Talak and Jennifer Hay um, and I thought it was excellent just because, well, it was partly because I recently went traveling and it was quite interesting to like see how you use traveling and then write about it. But also particularly because it was about the US and they traveled through quite a lot of states like the Rust Belt and the coal mining countries that have been very relevant in politics lately. So it was really interesting to obviously get their views about it, but actually also like an on the ground um, impression of it as well, yeah. I've been to a few events in the last couple of years and one of the really common questions and I also know a couple of writers who don't really like the question is always like, so what inspired you to write this work? And this is all very personal and like kind of what got you to write this? And I think a project like that kind of shows where the inspiration comes from without saying, look, here's where the inspiration comes from. And um, yeah, I kind of feel like it gives you a bit of background information while also showing how work comes into being as well. And everybody likes hearing about travelling as well. <laughs> So I've been to the Book Festival for the last couple of years and um, I do keep coming back, I live in Glasgow so it's not very far um, but also it's a very important cultural event from, I work in the literary industry as a translator so I usually am as an editor um, and I usually pick translation events of which um, the Edinburgh Book Festival usually has quite a lot um, I have an interest in like Argentine writing so I went to the other Outriders event about Argentina as well um, so yeah I usually go to these kinds of events but I also feel like it's quite a close encounter with the with the writers that come along as well um, yes yeah, so, and to kind of also keep up to date with like Scottish literature as a whole as well yeah and what I like about the atmosphere is that you can just wander in just sit in the in the space and um, just kind of soak it on and I love the bookshop as well <laughs> it's like where you just get tempted at every corner and um, I do also like because I kind of work in the industry that you keep bumping into people and it's usually people you've not expected to bump into like you know if some writers are going to be around and some like other critics and so on, but I um, usually bump into other people as well. But I also think like you can like, meet people in a more friendly atmosphere in the sense that you're not meeting at an industry event or you're not meeting like at, because somebody's trying to sell you something. Of course, there's books for sale, but it's like it's a bit more casual. And usually, I've like knock on wood, I've been very lucky with the weather. So like every time I've come, there's been like glorious sunshine. So I'm always hoping when I come from Glasgow that like Edinburgh's going to be sunny. <laughs>